Thank you, Gus. We're um, especially thankful for Keaton today and taking off work to lead us in, um, in worship. And so what a blessing you've been to us today. Thank you, Keaton. Yeah. So we're going to um, continue our summer in the Psalms this morning. And this morning we're going to be looking at a different kind of psalm. It's actually what's called a pastoral psalm or a wisdom psalm. And that means that it is something that provides counsel or a lesson to help us navigate life in some ways. And this um, particular one that we're looking at today was written by David. But unlike some of the other psalms, this one was written by David in his later years. And so you have a sense of him being older and looking back and having learned from the experiences that he's had with God and with people since then. Doesn't age have a way of doing that to you? You know, that the things that when you were younger would get you all in a tizzy or you thought were such a big deal, and then you're older and you look back and you're like, it wasn't that big a deal at all, was it? <laughs> and so, so it's kind of cool to hear this wisdom of David coming um, from him in a new way and seeing the maturity that he's gained over the years of his life. And so if you were with us for Bible Basics, on Wednesday night, Susan led us through Second Samuel, and you kind of saw David going through, you know, like great victories and then great failures. And at the end of Second Samuel is like this kind of summary. The last four chapters are kind of a summary, of looking back over the things that he had been through and um, so much loss in his life, but he still loved the Lord. And so I think David has a lot to teach us. So we're going to be looking today at Psalm 37, and um, one of the things that, that you might want to note about Psalm 37 is that it's also called an acrostic poem or psalm, so that means that each verse actually corresponded to a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it'd be like if you were writing something and your first one started with A and your second one started, the second line started with B, and so it goes through that. That means that sometimes it looks a little random, like didn't we already cover that and here it is again, you know, so... He's, he's making it fit into that alphabet. And um, I don't think he did that just for fun, although that might be fun. <laughs> but, but I think it's also a memory tool because remember that in, in these days, you didn't necessarily have your Bible that you could take with you, right? And so the goal was for people to remember the Psalms and to remember the lessons that they're learning. So having something written in that format would help you to remember what was the next line. It started with a D. Oh, yeah, here it goes. And so um, so it doesn't translate that well to English, um, but it's kind of cool, I think, to know that it was there when it was written. So this morning we're going to read the whole, I'm going to read all of Psalm 37 to you, and then we'll go back and kind of talk about it since it's not necessarily flowing in the same order that some of them do. So if you want to read along with me, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Psalm 37 it says, Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him. And he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. And the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. And stop being angry. Turn from your rage don't lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the godly. They snarl at them in defiance. But the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right. 
but their swords will stab their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. It is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young, and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others, and their children are a blessing. Turn from evil and do good, and you will live in the land forever. For the Lord loves justice, and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep, keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own, and they will never slip from his path. The wicked wait in ambush for the godly, looking for an excuse to kill them. But the Lord will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path, and he will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen wicked and ruthless people flourishing like a tree in its native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them, and they find shelter in him. Some of that sounds a little bit like Proverbs, doesn't it? Godly advice. And what we see here is that David is identifying two different types of people, right? The wicked and the godly. And as he goes through um, the psalm, he's comparing the outcome for each. And he's saying the wicked are on this path and the godly are on this path. And in the end, you will see a difference. So he says the godly will inherit the land, or we might interpret that as the kingdom, right? He says that God saves them, and they have a wonderful future and a home for, with him. They will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. The evil, though, have a different outcome. Did you hear it? They will die or disappear. The Lord will not let them succeed, and they have no future. And so what we see through this psalm then is this sense of justice, that if you are good, it leads to good things, and if you are bad, it leads to bad things. And, and certainly as humans, that's a, an internal clock that we have of justice, right? We all have this need for justice. We, we want to see good people succeed, and we want to see bad people fail. But when you look around the world, it doesn't always look like that, does it? Sometimes it seems that evil people are prospering. Sometimes it seems like the good are floundering. And so we cry out for justice, for people to get what they deserve. When a suspect dies at the hands of police, cries go out for justice. When a young child is ruthlessly murdered on his bicycle, cries go out for justice. You see, this is a basic human 
thermometer almost, you know, this need for justice. That's not right. That shouldn't have happened. We need justice. And why is that so important to us? I think it's because God made us that way. That our creator installed in, instilled in us from the very beginning this sense of good and evil and this sense of good leads to good outcomes and evil leads to bad outcomes and this desire for justice to see that happen in others around us. We have this internal measuring system within us that determines what is fair and what is not fair. Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, there was a lot of this saying, that's not fair. <laughs> I was the youngest of four children, right? And so that was kind of a common battle cry at our house. That's not fair. Whenever one child got something that the other children didn't, the other children would look at me and go, that's not fair. <laughs> Or whenever somebody didn't get the same punishment as someone else who did the same wrong, committed the same wrong, then you would hear, but that's not fair. And why is it that children are so good at keeping track? Have y'all ever noticed that? They don't let you forget it. They know exactly what behavior is supposed to bring about what judgment or what price. Children are great detectors of injustice especially when it's not in their favor. <laughs> we kept score pretty well at my house. I would have to admit to you that as the youngest in the family, the scales often tipped in my favor, right? So when I was 16 and thereafter, I got a new car every two years, a brand new car every two years. That's not fair. My siblings drove the things that they could afford right? The things that were falling apart and they'd have to put it back together. And But by the time I was old enough to drive, my parents were in a much different position. And so I prospered because of that. That's not fair. But there was also this common response to our cries about fairness, I have to tell you. Because what we often heard in response to that's not fair is life's not always fair. Who told you life was supposed to be fair? I can remember that one a lot. Why do you have an expectation that things in our family are going to be fair? Deal with it. Suck it up, buttercup. Right? <laughs> Even though we cry out for justice, that's a lot like life. We don't always get what's fair. Have you found that to be true? I think this is what makes Psalm 37 an appropriate piece of wisdom for us today. Because David is acknowledging that life is not always fair. That sometimes the wicked do seem to prosper. People do get ahead by victimizing others. Crimes are committed and sometimes criminals go free. Other times they get elected into office. Sorry. <laughs> All of that can make us angry or worried because we feel like we have to do something to even the scales, don't we? That there's something in us that when we see things that are unfair, we think we have to do something about it. And we can lose hope in a system that just doesn't seem to be fair. But life can become very dangerous when we take fairness into our own hands when we try to be the administrators of justice. And I find that especially true when we don't understand or we don't agree on what justice looks like, right? Because what I think is just may not be the same as what you think is just. Power struggles can develop as we seek out the kind of justice that we think should apply in any given situation. So what should we do in the face of injustice? When evil seems to be winning, I think David tells us, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. 
and like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good, and then you will live safely in the land and prosper. So what is our response to injustice? Don't worry. Trust in the Lord and do good. That's what David says. Isaiah 1 says that we should plead the case of the widow and bring justice to the orphan. So that doesn't mean we don't ever stand up for others when we see injustice, right? And widows and orphans represent the weak and the defenseless in a society. And so definitely, as Christians, we're called to stand up for those who can't defend themselves. But it is not our job as individuals to destroy or determine the fate of the unjust. That belongs to God. And so we care and we make a stand and we help others. But in the end, we leave that judgment to God. In Romans 12, we see a quote, from, includes a quote from Deuteronomy. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Justice belongs to God. And justice, or the demand for justice, never gives us the right to suppress someone else or to act in hatred or violence. That belongs to God. And what David is saying in this psalm is that we don't have to worry about whether justice will eventually come to those who are evil because they will eventually get what is due to them. But that will come through God and not through us. They will face judgment before him one day, as will we. And he is the only one who can truly judge a human. So we have to wait for his justice and trust that it will come. Trust that he really is a God who loves justice and who brings it about, but realizing that it's very often in a time frame that we can't see. And maybe even based on a truth that we don't see. That's wisdom, isn't it? Acknowledging that there may be things that we don't understand. Understanding that God has a job that he didn't give to us. And trusting that he will bring it about in his due time. Don't worry. Trust God. Do good. God is still in charge even when it looks like the wicked are winning. And is there anything in this world that he can't control? I don't think so. It all belongs to him. So in light of that, then David is saying, choose to be godly. Turn from evil and do good. It's better to have little and be godly than the evil and rich. That's a good one to memorize, isn't it? Don't be full of anger and rage because that just makes it worse. Instead, be the person God has called you to be. And that boils down to trust. When we trust God and devote our lives to him, we can be confident that he is working it out all according to his plan. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the de your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn, and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Do you believe that? That's what David is telling us. And I have to tell you, I've seen, that was verses, I think, 4, 5, and 6, and I've seen verse 4 misquoted sometime. He will give you your heart's desires. Giving you your heart's desires does not mean that you walk outside the church and your new Lexus is waiting for you. Even if that's what my heart desires, God. <laughs> it means that as you turn your heart to God and take delight in him and his way, he will give you everything you need 
to find joy and peace. It's found in him. Right? It doesn't mean whatever I can think of that I want, he will give me. What it means is that as my heart becomes shaped like his, he fulfills every need that I have because my desire is for him. That's when justice will shine. I think we needed this message today. I think we needed that reminder that we can't fight injustice with anger or rage or more injustice. We fight it by standing with God, trusting in his power, and that when he is in charge, we don't have to fret or to worry. And I think there's even a greater message in that. Because how many times do we worry because we don't see the outcome? And so I don't think this is just about justice. I think it's about life in general. Don't worry. Don't worry. And there are so many things that we are tempted to worry about, aren't there? Yeah, starting school, a new job, or looking for a job. So many things that, that we can become preoccupied with, our health, our financial situation. What if, what if I don't get the class I need to graduate? Or what if I don't get married? What am I going to be when I grow up? Or when will I take my last breath? And what condition am I going to be in when that happens? In a congregation this size, we are small, right? But there are a lot of things that could worry us, aren't there? A lot of situations that we could face that we don't know how it's going to turn out. And I think that we can take this message from Psalm 37 and apply it to those things and listen to what God says don't worry. Trust God and do good. Maybe you don't know how you're going to confront that situation you're facing. Maybe you don't know if your relationship is going to be restored. Maybe you don't know if you've got what it takes to do that job. You know what? Don't worry. Trust God and do good. He has a plan for you and if he called you to it he will see you through it right and so if you really want to know how do you not worry make sure you're in line with him that's how you that's how it happens if you're going out there on your own and trying to do it your way and trying to to fight wicked with wicked or join in and only be a little evil or whatever it is you might be doing then you got plenty of cause to worry but when you're living your life dedicated to Jesus you don't have to worry he promises it'll all turn out okay. He has a plan for your life and a future for you. And you don't have to worry. There are plenty of outcomes that we can't control. And waiting for answers is hard. But when we believe in God, we can trust the outcome. Even when it looks like it's not fair. Because he is in control of us, and we have submitted ourselves and our futures to him. Verse 7 said, Be still in the presence of the Lord, and wait patiently for him to act. We can wait. We can be patient. We can trust that God is in control. And he's promised you a great inheritance as a part of his kingdom. Do you believe it? Do you believe that you have an inheritance in God's kingdom? I hope that you do. That when life seems unfair here, what you can hold on to is that's okay because my inheritance is still coming. Right? And I might not have the latest car. And I might not have the the spouse that I want. And I might not know what the future holds, but what I do know is that God's going to make sure it's all okay because I belong to him. And he wants the very best for me. Be 
Jesus said that we shouldn't worry and that faith in him is the answer. These are his words. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Do you believe that? I hope you do. And 1 Peter 5, 7 is one of my favorite verses. It says, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. And because he's bigger than you. And because he will make it all work out. When we decide not to worry, it's not an act of denial or ignorance. It's a choice to have faith in the God who cares about you. Do you trust him this morning? I want to challenge each of you that if there is something that you are worried about, could you turn it over to him today? Could you make a conscious choice to say, God, this is big or this is uncertain, or this is unfair. But I'm going to hand it to you to take care of. Because I know you can handle it so much better than I can. And then I'm just going to enjoy being your child. Don't let the worries of this life take you off track from following God's ways. As we go into another time of worship then, I encourage you to picture yourself turning those things over to God and then sing his praises because he is trustworthy and he can handle anything we're worried about. A wonderful future awaits those who love peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. That in a crazy mixed up world where there is so much turmoil and so much uncertainty, we don't have to be uncertain. Because you called us into your kingdom and you made these promises that apply to us. And what we know above anything else is that we belong to you and you will make it all okay. I pray God for those who are in this room right now who may be worrying about something, that they would find that the opposite of worry is faith, that they would be assured that, that even when people don't do the things we want them to do or say the things we want them to do, it's all okay because it's in your hands and you know exactly what we need. Father, we love peace. We love you, and so we submit ourselves to you and your ways this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Let's worship.